Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2% Better Health Podcast. I'm your host, Carrie Bennett, and today I am so, so excited to talk to Dr. Corey Gasvini. I'm going to read his bio, but I'm then also going to say a couple things about Corey that I absolutely think are brilliant. So, uh, Corey Gasvini, also known as the Optimal Light Doc, is a doctor of oriental medicine. He is a licensed acupuncturist and traditional Chinese herbologist, and also nationally board certified in biomedicine impressive. He graduated summa cum laude from Florida College of Integrative Medicine in 2019, er earning an MS in Oriental Medicine. He is in private practice in Ta Tallahassee, Florida, and is the CEO and leading clinician of Optimal Light. Optimal Light is a health education initiative providing coaching and education to clients worldwide. Using the integration of ancient philosophies of the East and meeting them with the modern scientific innovations of the West, Corey provides clients with the actionable information they need to achieve the quantum leap toward optimal health. Trying to decipher nature's messages, his ultimate goal is to answer all of life's most enduring questions. Who are we? Where did we come from? Why do we get sick? And what makes us healthy? He is currently writing a series of blogs on, uh, or a series on the origins of biology and how light created life in evolution on Patreon. So we'll make sure we get all that information towards the end. Join the revolution and reconnect with nature where epigenetics reverses disease. Corey, I am so excited to talk to you today. Um, welcome. Oh, Thanks for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. I mean, like, I feel like you're putting out such amazing information into the field. Let's just go right there, right? <laughs> into the field. Um, I appreciate and, you saying that. Yeah, no, it's, it's been so much fun to just kind of like uh, tune in whenever you're on, right? Because I think that you have such a unique perspective. And before we started recording, we were just talking about how this is the first time both you and I get to chat with someone who's both a practitioner of acupuncture, tr traditional Chinese medicine, energy flow, and also this kind of biophysics. And it's so exciting. So uh, can we start? I'm totally ready. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I appreciate the compliments that you made about uh, some of the information that I put out there. And I think that's a great way for me to kind of get started with what we're going to talk about. Because, you know, I truly believe that I could just change the message and uh, create these memes. I don't know where I came up with the idea. I think it was uh, from being involved in the Bitcoin space that uh, I heard that the memes can change the world, right? Mm -hmm. sure. And uh, people can relate to memes more than they can anything else these days because our attention spans have been reduced so dramatically. So um, I decided I would take uh, brilliant concepts that I learn from uh, other people that are way ahead of me and try to concise them into these image images that contain memes so that uh, people could understand them in an individualized basis. And it's a good way to remember them. And not only that, I hope that the information can then be shared around the world, you know, via the internet so that other people can, uh, can kind of get these ideas in their head and understand because, you know, the message is so divine. It's not even my message, you know, it's, it's not even um, Gerald Pollack's message or um, Dr. Cruz's message or Alexander Wunsch's message. It's really Mother Nature's message that we're all trying to decipher and to explain. So uh, I think that's what we really need to pay homage to is that the reason that this information is so interesting is uh, because it's the message of nature itself. That I think that's wonderful. It's a great introduction because I think your background and you mentioning both this idea of ancient healing and then also kind of, I guess, us catching up to it with our understanding in the quantum space. Uh, I think we have to pay homage to the fact that there are so many ancient practices that have understood healing in the body so much more profoundly than we currently do. And we're just starting to catch up to it. And I think I'm starting to reframe it in a quantum perspective, but 
also then going back towards my understanding of energy flow in the body through the meridian system. And so I think that that is kind of where we can begin. We can start to say, uh, the energy flow, right, is what is most important in the body. We, and when the flow of energy, so in traditional Chinese medicine, when the flow of energy is blocked, that can manifest itself as disease, dysfunction, chaos, right? There's lots of ways we can describe that. And so can we start to discuss like, how does the body set up energy flow and why mm -hmm. and how and why? And, and let's just go into it from there. I like that question, but I've, uh, I've been more inspired by the introduction, and I think that in order for the uh, listener to understand the whole complexity, I'd like to start much earlier than that and to see uh, how and why we believe the things that we currently do. Perfect. So first of all, I can talk about how Chinese medicine is rooted in Taoism, right? And Taoism is the ancient philosophy of nature. So there were observers of the universe and they had perceived that it was the most mystical and impressive thing that life had created itself somehow within the universe. And uh, when you talk about paying homage, uh, you know, they truly believed in Taoism that whatever nature does, we must inevitably do, right? And uh, they also perceived, uh, you know, more complex things that we won't get into today, but, you know, the concepts of like wood, fire, earth and metal, and how these elements existed in a continuum and created all of the complex uh, entities. And that there was a fractal there, that the universe was, uh, so interrelated and intercommunicating constantly. And uh, those concepts exist at every finite detail and also within the cosmos itself. And so, um, you know, there are actually aspects that, that show the five elements relating to organ systems. And I think it's totally cool that you have a background in massage as well, because I'm sure that you know that massage is the original form of Chinese medicine and acupuncture is essentially a derivative of massage. So um, we're the OGs uh, in, in the historical timeline. And, um, you know, with Taoism, you have uh, the great philosopher Lao Tzu, who actually wrote um, The Way of the Tao, which is uh, basically the Tao Te Ching says, the word that can can be spoken is actually not the word or the name that can be named is not the name. Right. So. It seems that they most likely understood relativity there to a great degree and. Um, watching nature to find the truth was uh, at the core of those ancient beliefs, so. That, that brings you along more to so uh, to Zen Buddhism, which uh, nothing is reality but mind, you know, and and that's the philosophical framework that that separatism is an illusion, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, modern modern physics actually explains a lot of that in great detail, and it seems that without having the descriptive words that science has found or the mathematical formulas, they were able to explain it in their ancient texts. Um, you know, Lao Tzu wrote Tao Te Ching, like, I think 1200 BC. So that brings us more to uh, something that's more important and divine that we can still relate to today, the yin yang symbol. And it represents you know, the paradoxical conflicts and how they're so correlated. And so the universe is a fractal and everything in the universe has a component of yin and yang. So I usually associate it more so to the light and dark cycle than anything else. But it's also the relationship between movement and still and stillness 
and um, transformation because um, this shows a relationship to both sides and how yin and yang constantly transform into each other. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, I think that the yin yang symbol represents chaos and the crystal state, mm -hmm. which explains, you know, a lot of quantum physics, how life is a coherent entity, right? Right. And uh, that's the perfect representation of that. So it's opposing, yet in a delicate, permanent balance. And um, those ancients perceive spiritual entities and, you know, the ethereal phenomenon of light, magnetism, and gravity, and vibrations are something that they spoke, spoke about ad nauseum, right? Or the concept of, uh, of ghosts and, and different ethereal energies mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, if, if we try and talk about with our modern perspective, we totally are in disbelief. But in reality, there's no difference between ghosts and, and electromagnetic fields, you know? The only real difference is that physics, um, you know, Maxwell took the mathematical formulas to explain them, right? Right. But, but they're truly there. And, you know, with that, we know that the electromagnetic influence of the universe is by far the dominant force. And we can only perceive 1% of that universe as it exists around us. So, you know, the ancient Chinese word for magnet is translated to a stone with love so that's really interesting when you when you understand that they were fully aware of um, invisible energies and they didn't find the importance in taking too much time to explain that in great detail because they believed it to the core and they understood it very well I'd like to fast forward from then into uh, more so of the modern perspective of materialism and reductionism, which is, you know, associated more so with the standard 19th century model of physics. Mm -hmm. And the, the 19th century perspective of physics was more about definite weight, space, solid phenomena, sure. chemicals and molecules that have a ball and stick like structure. And uh, those, those led into really great breakthroughs with technology and engineering and uh, biochemistry and even psychology. You know, Freud himself um, viewed, viewed man as an animalic machine. Mm -hmm. And that perspective really drove home the idea that, you know, the body is a machine and sort of a doctors are, are just like a, a mechanic. Or, or a sort of engineer that needs to find which one of these divisible parts has a problem and to come and repair those parts, right? Right. And biology is basically still stuck in that perspective, even though you know physics has gone way far beyond and modern science understands all of these invisible fields, you know, the strong and weak force, the gravitational force, and the electromagnetic force. But biology still doesn't acknowledge those concepts. And so we're lagging over 100 years behind because physics is always is almost approaching now the grand unified theory. Sure. Right. You know what? I would argue too, Corey, that we're lagging like thousands of years behind. Because what what the ancient civilizations knew was was that the that the invisible, how, however they perceived it, was more important than the visible. Invisible was more more important than the material. And biology is still so hell bent on studying what they can visibly see is broken. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And and I don't want to I don't want to beat modern medicine or um you know the the medical industry up too bad. Certainly. I spent a lot of time being really negative about that because I think they've overstepped their role dramatically. But uh, in all honesty, I, I love um, I love Western medicine. You know, I love the medical industry for the countless uh, situations that many of my loved ones have been in in emergency situations that have saved their lives and saved my life. 
right? 100%. Yeah, so I, I'm totally game with that. Uh, I, I just hope that at some point, talks like these can, can bridge that gap for everyone to come to a middle way of understanding that, that there is merit to both sides and, and they're very equivalent and they're trying to describe the same thing uh, when it really all comes down to it. So you mentioned invisible forces. And so, you know, I already mentioned, like most of that comes from uh, quantum physics. You know, you have Heisenberg and Niels Bohr um, that try to describe all of these um, invisible forces that interact with the molecules or, or that exists, you know, between molecules in it, and it reduces much further than the atom itself. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Faraday was uh, one of the first people to really explain it so well when, when he talked about electromagnetism and he tried to describe radio waves. When, he fir when we first started to understand those concepts, people couldn't believe that they existed because you couldn't see it with mm -hmm. your own eyes. Right. Right. And, and that led us, uh, led us to stay stagnant, you know, and, and modern medicine is still looking for matter, they're still ignoring quantum physics. And if there's not a molecular mechanism to describe it, or a structure, they, they find very difficult, um, difficult dissonance to be able to accept it, right? It, it's, it's a, it, it can't be treated if you can't see it is and I, I think that is leading us potentially to this idea of the meridians, because there isn't necessarily a physical, well-established system in Western medicine that you can just say, it's like, you know, you can't dissect out the meridians because mm -hmm. it's energy, right? It's in the space that where there is, no, <laughs> is nothing, yeah, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's a hard concept to wrap around, but I think that what when we marry the meridians with energy flow that we know from this biophysics concept that we are just electrical beings and we're literally funneling energy and electricity and that's therefore information throughout our system and uh when we can't do that that can be a problem correct exactly yeah so that's why i'm going to land this plane so realistically um Ilya progeny found the dissipative structure. So the body itself is a dissipative structure and it makes order out of chaos, right? Which is uh, seemingly impossible. And it, it sort of breaks all the laws of physics in reality. So we have uh, modern devices that allow us to perceive the electromagnetic energy, like, you know, an ECG or an EKG. And, and we know uh, without a shadow of a doubt, because of the work of uh, Fritz Pop, that mm -hmm. we have extreme low frequency UV light being emitted by all biological entities. And, and we know that we can use infrared cameras to see that we're emitting infrared light. So, so, so biology is a sea of electromagnetical um, waves and electromechanical waves. And uh, those are those are actually chi photons mm -hmm. when it comes down to it. And I'll talk a little bit about more uh, how to explain what chi really is. But, you know, the, the coherence of the body comes down to energy, energy distribution. And I'm sorry, I have a ton of notes. I can't recall the information nearly as well as you can. So you're I'm just you're fine. Do, do your thing. That. You do your thing. So 90% of energy is invisible in that way. So to try and have a visual, uh, I, I like of it uh, sort of like a guitar or a violin. So the, the guitar has these, these boundaries that contain those waves and those in, in that way are acoustic waves. So something that maybe you can visualize better. And that actually amplifies the waves as well, right? Mm -hmm. So it brings us you know, to, to acupoints, like what, what really are they? So the channels, and, and I liken to the term channels. Mm -hmm. uh, most modern uh, acupuncturists, I, I prefer to use the word channels because the relationship to the word meridians, I think is a, is a poor translation. 
it was it was a translation that was described only because um, at the time the longitude and latitudinal lines were the best way to describe it. But because uh, we understand now that there's electromagnetic waves that are traveling through these spaces, and that it's actually um, the space between tissues where the channels exist, mm -hmm. there's nothing there. So the, the better term is channels, and I like to use that more descriptively in that way. So they're, they're locations of, of higher conductivity. And so the channels not only transmit electromagnetic energy, but they, they transmit microwave energy and acoustic energy more likely. Mm -hmm. So it's really complex in that way. So I, I describe it by the, the Chinese translation of Jing Luo. That's the term for the channel system. And that consists of two characters. And the first character is Jing, and it's devised into uh, to two different parts. So, you know, Chinese characters are like little tiny paintings that tell a story. And the first character is the word si, which is the prefix for the English word silk. And it's drawn like a fine thread woven into fabric, right? That, that describes the fascia. The fascia, as you've talked about plenty of times, is a collagen network. And uh, collagen is the most abundant protein in the body. It's actually one third of all the protein in the entire body is made from collagen. And uh, collagen is mostly water. The word comes from the Greek word kala, which means glue. Mm -hmm. And the suffix is gen, which means genesis or creator. So collagen literally means glue creator, right? And in the ancient times, sinews and skin was boiled down into gelatin, which was used as a form of glue. And that, that collagen is a triple helix, right? Mm -hmm. And that triple helix spontaneously self-assembles itself. And it has subunits called triple collagen. Each one of those units are identical. And you could think of uh, in comparison to like a DNA, which is a double helix. Right. Well, it's a triple helix. And, and that triple helix then spontaneously assembles another triple helix called a super helix. And that's called also a microfibril, microfibril which is, uh, I think, like what you describe as the super proton highway, where intercommunication within the body occurs. And that collagen is actually semi-crystalline. So it's, it's in a regular repeating order of atoms in a two-dimensional structure. So that, that collagen is actually piezoelectric. So it's like a grill lighter that contains a quartz. That quartz is also a piezoelectric crystal. So when you press the button and that quartz is compressed, it creates a DC electric current or a spark inside the lighter. And the same thing happens in your body in the collagenous structure that covers your entire body, right? Right. It's also, it's like a semiconductor. It's not, it's not necessarily an insulator and not necessarily a conductor. So in that way, it's, it's similar to how a computer works, right? Made of mm -hmm. semiconductors. And the fascia encases all of these structures. So it does have a structural component. Surgeons are very familiar with how the fascial planes are aligned. They're called Langer lines. And they use them to be able to... Uh, make brilliant incisions along Langer lines to be able to, so the body can be able to heal more appropriately, mm -hmm. heal faster and more effectively. And that's uh, really because of the piezoelectric concept of, of fascia and collagen. And uh, so these fascial planes are organized along lines of stress and structural change. And um, their, their deformation is what induces the DC electric current or the piezoelectricity. And they're, they're organized along lines of stress. So you can imagine 
like say if you jump off the tailgate of a pickup truck, right? And the the bones there that are that are coated with all of this fascia, you have micro tears, and we can see those lines of stress. They're called trabeculae in X-rays. And, and whenever those micro tears exist in the collagen and in the bone structure, it stimulates that DC electric current to then lay new crystals. That's how bone ossification works. We know from reading uh, Robert O'Becker's work that he was the first person to really understand that so well. So the fascia and the collagen are a connective tissue. And it's like a collagenous matrix that, that provides intracellular communication, not only a structural component. And uh, that, that plasma is, uh, is a connective tissue. You even have a concept of the blood being a connective mm -hmm. tissue, right? So it's, blood is 55% plasma. And that's part of that network as well. So it's everywhere. And for that very reason, it has been ignored by the reductionist perspective, you know? So if something is everywhere, it, it must not have a major function, uh, you know, to the organism as a whole other than structure, you know? Okay, well, it's there. And if you don't see any molecular interaction, if you don't, and if you don't see any um, obvious mechanism, then, you know, that structure must not, must not be something that's doing anything significant. So for that, for that matter, it's ignored as being uh, of any significant importance to the overall body um, and how it functions, per se. So it's really this, about the space between the fascia, though, right. where, where the light waves and the intercommunication occurs. So you can imagine, you know, your house is a structure, and in between the house, like inside of it is what you actually use, right? It's not so much the wood and the walls that are of importance. It's the, the hallways and the living room and the bedroom that you're actually using. So imagine the, the channels as being the space in between those fascial compartments. And uh, it's like the lung meridian runs right here between the brachioradialis and the pronator teres between those muscles is where that line of intercommunication exists. Mm -hmm. It uh, brings us to the concept more so of chi, right? Sure. And uh, that's a long haul subject, but uh, to make it concise, the radical is drawn as uh, an exploding grain of rice at the bottom. And at the top, it's drawn like a steam or air. So both portions are acknowledged equally that uh, it's not only a metabolic function there from, from food or something of nourishment, there's also something ethereal. And, um, you know, we can reduce that to food plus air equals energy, right? Or in other words, glucose plus oxygen equals carbon dioxide and energy. So somehow, some way, they understood mitochondrial respiration, you know? Mm -hmm. And within that chi, they also understood there's not just, you know, um, an energetic component, but there's also an innate intelligence. That's the way that chiropractic often describes it, that there's this information there within those waves within that energy that is of the utmost importance. So talked about um, more so about the Jing Luo. So the first uh, part of the character Jing means uh, silk or fine thread or woven fabric, right? And then Luo, so the second part is actually uh, drawn as like a deep underground rivers. So it's sort of the macrocosm meets the microcosm. The, those, those rivers had contained with them magical or divine qualities. And, you know, because of the ancients perceived such importance to the rivers and how much energy and nourishment they provided 
you know, to all of the animals and all of the systems in the earth, they knew that those also must have had to exist in the body. So that's the way, the way that they used to describe the channels. So the channels are actually like a deep underground river of water. And we know that there's mostly water there, and that's the medium that the light actually travels. So more so, the word luo also means net. So it's like a collagenous net. There's this intracellular proteins that exist in the cell, but collagen is an extracellular protein that organizes the space between. And children have stronger chi, and that's because they're still growing. You know, that's why in uh, the ancient perspective is that children are, are pure yang, right? And I don't know if you know this, but like the distal part of your finger beyond the second knuckle, if, if a child below the age of six actually gets that part severed, they can regrow it uh, themselves. And that's because they have so much chi maintained for, you know, growing. And, um, Furthermore, you start to think, yeah, well, how does that network form, right? And luckily, we did have a lot of brilliant science from histology and embryology that led us to understand how the embryo actually forms. And, uh, you know, this that reminds us of the human fractal. So the embryo forms initially from conception, you have one zygote right which is a single cell and it undergoes cellular division and that one cell becomes two cells those two cells divide to become four and those four to become eight now at that moment any of those one cells can be separated to form its own embryo by its own way so we know that within each one of the cells contains all of the information necessary to build the entire organism. So it's, it's amazing when you think about how much intercommunication really needs to take place in the biological system, right? Because between one and two cells, you, you actually just need one line of communication, right? But for three cells, you need one plus two lines of communication. And for four cells, you need one plus two plus three for five, one plus two plus three plus four, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. So if there's a trillion cells actually there in the body, that is actually one septillion lines of communication, meaning <laughs> that's a, that's a, right, big, a heck of a, a lot. <laughs> number one with 25 zeros behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Can it's I, just, can I, it, it's astonishing when I think of that. Can I, can I like just draw attention, yeah. I think, to something there? And that is this idea of um, when every cell up to that eight cell phase contains all the information needed to generate an entirely new organism. And I think, I think we have to separate a couple of things right with that because everyone's going to say, well, of course it does because it's got DNA, right? It's got the chromosomes, it's got the DNA. And I, I think it's misunderstood, but DNA just provides it encodes for proteins. So it basically just provides the bricks, the brick and mortar of what is going to be built. It's a blueprint but of the structure. A blueprint, but it, well, it's, it's the, I would argue it's the, it's the, it's like makes the material, but it doesn't tell you how to organize that material. I believe that that information is also encoded in the cell or in these, in these individual cells. And I believe this, that's kind of what you're talking about. It's like, we get at birth this, the ability to understand what our form should take. Every cell pulls in information from the field uh, about how that, that embryo will develop and how this will become the arm. This will become the leg, even though every single cell contains the same exact genetic information, it needs to be told exactly what genetic information to produce. So what bricks to make, and then another field of information has to interact with that to talk about how do we rearrange these bricks in this particular tissue. And uh, so I think we have to distinguish that there is this idea that yes, we have to build the bricks, but also 
we got to get the information to, to the, the specific blueprint. This field of information has to tell the bricks how to assemble. And that's where I think a lot of people, um, I, I don't think it's appreciated, right? That there's no, there is, there's a lot of theories about that. And I think that this could be a unifying concept about how that information comes in to the organism. And then also then how that information gets disseminated throughout the organism. Yeah, so what happens is with any well-intelligent or organized system, there are chains of command, right? Systems theory explains that concept really well. So as a thought concept, we can imagine uh, cities are, are sort of nodes, right? And the nodes start to organize in the embryo. Hans Spimmen got the Nobel for that in 1935. It's called the organizer effect. And so these nodes are like the ports of New York or, you know, the ports of uh, Miami, the ports of Chicago, where all of these, these rivers connect or these waterways connect where you can go and divide communication and interrelationships, bring communication and energy and trade from further distances to be able to have a center network so that the entire system can communicate as a whole. And uh, so the whole is much more than the sum. So the organizing centers, instead of cells needing to communicate well amongst each other, they start to organize just to communicate with the organizing centers, you know, that's complexity out of chaos. So without the whole system, a single cell is just lost and has no idea what to do. And that's exactly what you're talking about, right? So these nodes in the system actually become the acupuncture points. And these are the organizer points that are interconnected to the entire system. Without them, each cell has no idea what to do. That's how the structure is formed with its innate intelligence. So it's all, it's all fractalized, you know? Still, like, even cells itself are like, are like little tiny humans. So the skin is like a cell membrane and it has a brain, which is called a nucleus. And the mitochondria are like the lungs of the cell. The stomach is, is uh, the vacuole, mm -hmm. right? And they're even called organelles, which are tiny organs. And, you know, now that we understand that there's an electromagnetic body, we have these acupoints that are perceived of and measured as prominent areas of an interference pattern formed by superposition of invisible electromagnetic standing waves. Let's, and, let's break that down. I think yeah. that's important for people to, to for people to understand. So right. let me let me let me rephrase that. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. you go for it. Okay, you go you for can. it. Well, I, so from what I get from that, and feel free to add and correct, is this idea that we a lot of these different channels connect in key areas. And that that connection is really important for being able to funnel information that might be coming from one area into another and uh, and and that we need that we need both the input, the, the 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 information coming in, we need the input of the information, but also that we need the ability to disseminate that information to make a system coherent. Absolutely. Yeah, great way to describe it. Did better than I could have for sure. So the body is always in a quasi equilibrium state, right? It's, it's never, it's never out of that. It's, it's always like, um, in and out of coherence, right? And it's trying to maintain coherence by, uh, sometimes there's more chaos and then sometimes there's more of a crystalline order. And, uh, we could describe that communication with waves, right? So unlike particles, which are, um, we can visualize as acoustic waves, electromagnetic waves can occupy the same space and they can even combine to form single waves. And disease is realistically just an unhealthy distribution of the waves or disturbance patterns that exist among these communication lines. And can waves I, can either be, can, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I, this, I have a beautiful visual of this. This is perfect because 
I was watching a, a presentation by from Mei Wan Ho, right? And she showed um, light essentially coming from the extracellular matrix of a tumor and light coming from the extracellular matrix of a healthy cell, similar, the same cell line, but one's a, one was a tumor and one was a healthy cell. And you can distinctly see a difference. The one that was um, a tumor, so a cancerous cell, the information that it almost looked like it was jobbled up, right? The, there was like some parts that were glowing, but then some parts were really dark. And so there was a lot of, I think, unnecessary, both constructive and destructive interference. So there's a lot of interference right. going on that wasn't syncing together. Whereas the, the, the cell that was very healthy and functioning, you saw the light energy working together. It, mm -hmm. it, it was working perfectly to create almost like a pattern, this beautiful pattern happening around the cell that was providing a bunch of energy flow and information to that cell. Right. So check it out, Carrie. In the embryo, as it grows from itself, I don't want to spend too much time on that. I'd love to speak on it more some someday. But the channels are actually extensions of the organs themselves, right? So each channel is associated with a specific organ for that very reason, because it's innervated into that organ system itself. So the organ and the channel are intercommunicating with each other, right? And, you know, some people believe that, you know, well, I don't need these, you know, channels open, right? Or that um, that's, that's not necessarily the problem with the biological system going awry. Well, the channels are a continuum. They never close. And, and each one is continuously open and they understand the circadian mechanism of those channels too, because each organ and channel system has its own specific time of day where it's most active. So there's never, there's never not really any, any flow. So you said constructive and destructive, you know, what really is that? So if, if two waves occupy the same space at the same time, constructive means those waves join together to form a bigger wave and destructive means they're actually interfering with each other to destroy each other, and they both get reduced to form a, a wave of lesser intensity, lesser energy, less information. So brings me to um, the interesting concept that's I think will blow your mind. What does the needle do, right? Because that's really the question that we're, we're here to find out. So the needle is changing the boundary resonance it's a new boundary there right and there are multiple mechanisms but this was the one that i find the most interesting so you can imagine uh the points are at regions where energy of interference pattern is it's is at its highest mm -hmm. See? sure so visualize acoustic waves like on the string of a guitar there's a certain obvious visual wave there when the string is plucked. But when you push down on the fret and reduce the boundary, you totally change the resonance, right? Sure. So there's this brilliant intercommunication to where you can dissipate those inappropriate waves or those waves of disease or ailment, right? Sure. And all of these mechanisms are not properly understood because we haven't delivered the appropriate scientific mechanisms or, or studies to actually describe them in full detail. Okay, can I, the guitar strings are perfect. It just, it just sparked something in me because we're talking about basically collagen that's lined with water that then basically forms a channel, right? So there's a channel of quote unquote empty space, but it's full of energy. What we know is that that the energy that gets that gets moved or excited in there or flowing through there it actually then creates what's called um like a resonance right so it, to the water molecules so it's like this vibrating energy this string this plucked guitar string that then communicates that message to the water and the water molecules then because they're structured and ordered like a crystal they they don't necessarily move all jumbly but they start to vibrate too to that exact same frequency and then when we take that to like a molecular level 
every molecule in the body also vibrates at a key resonant frequency. And so then any molecule that has a matching resonant frequency to from the energy that's flowing, that's being transmitted by the water, it will then basically almost like wake up that molecule or, t- or, or attract that molecule or excite and stimulate that molecule to do what it needs to do to perform the task that needs to be done. Right. And so like that's resonant totally energy transfer, right. but that's like how you can picture energy, just like nothingness that we see, but energy affecting the water, affecting the molecules, affecting the tissue, affecting the whole entire human body. Mm-hmm. And it's not just the energy, right? It's all, it's more so the information because that's correct. It, that's how the cells communicate to know when and what to do. Because that's right. really what disease is, you know, that's what a, a cancerous cell is actually lost all of its way. It doesn't have communication with the rest of the body. And right. it's, it's so important to visualize it more so is, is a form of light because that's actually what it is. 100%. In light, the photons carry so much more information than acoustic waves, right? Because they also have, they have the vertical wave, which is the electrical, and they have the parallel, which is the magnetical. They they have a ton of information and that provides all of the organization within the system. And, and that organization is, is how the system is always trying to maintain coherence. So can I add about- Alexander Wunsch yeah. onto that with the, the light, right? Okay. So Indeed. like you said, photons have this amazing information to them. And what I have found so interesting, so Alexander Wunsch, for those who don't know, he is a, he uses light. He's a doctor in Germany who uses light. Uh, in various ways from colors, but also just to circadian mechanisms. And he's, and he really understands using light from a healing perspective. He's the king. He's the king. Right. And yeah. um, what, what I loved about what he has said, and this also goes to Fritz Pop's work that you alluded to earlier. And Fritz Pop was the, basically the king is the king of biophotons and understanding right. biophotons. And it's this idea that a cell can take one biophoton. So basically one one particle even, but one little wave, one little uh, electromagnetic uh, capture bit, I will call it, of information. And what it does is it actually uh, will relay that bit of information to another molecule, to another molecule, to another molecule. And each time it kind of relays it or kind of funnels, channels that information. Energy and information transfer along. They transfer along, right? And so at the end, what you ultimately get is um, you ultimately get infrared. You get a light, a light that's been stripped of all of its uh, ordered energy, all of its energy that actually creates order and information in the cell and then dissipates as an, uh, uh, an infrared photon. And now we know that those infrared photons help to then restructure the water and keep the, it's like a, it's like a self recycling, self organizing system when all is functioning well. Totally. Yeah. And a living organism for that reason is capable of self repair. Mm-hmm. Right. And redu- reductionism refuses to acknowledge that, okay. that concept that it's so real. It, it's able to organize itself and build itself from one single cell. And we know that definitively, Yet we think any time that there's an element that there has to be something wrong with this biological system and we need to interject to find which part of that mechanism is wrong, change it out or either influence its, you know, molecular influences uh, with drugs and see what it's going to do. And it's just an ongoing experiment that is uh, proven to be a big problem, you know, the, the two main reasons that we trust the medical system so much, because, you know, before, before modern medicine, all we used were um, ancient modalities. And, and we had a ton of remedies that got us by for a really long time, but we didn't have anything for emergencies, mm-hmm. you know? We didn't have anything for infections. And it wasn't until Alexander Fleming actually found penicillin on accident to form antibiotics that gave modern pharmacology such a big trophy, right? That we could trust. But he didn't even find that on purpose and it grew from a mold. So even that came from mother nature. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and then I think then what, what we can add to that is like, 
this idea of there are there are ways that we see treating a treating a random part of the body in acupuncture or acupressure or just with some form of an energy medicine you can literally treat like i can literally potentially hold a spot right here that seemingly has nothing to do with anything and it can alleviate my headache it can actually help my body stimulate my, you know my help my contractions get stronger if i'm in the middle of like my preg if i'm at the end towards the end of my pregnancy and i'm starting to have contractions so it really is important to recognize so don't use that point on pregnancy though by the way it's contraindicated I, I i've only used it when i was actually having contractions and uh yeah. wanting to get that baby the heck out of me <laughs> that's exactly what that's used for yeah that's Hegu, large intestine four yeah it, it can you. Cause you to, uh, yes, yeah, we, we, we do. We would never, you don't, don't ever touch. Yeah. Don't touch that ever. Let's just ignore that completely. We don't want any sort of spontaneous have, anything happening, <laughs> but, but, but the point is that that's powerful, right? It's powerful because when you open energy or when you change energy or direct energy or like piezoelectricity, the, I mean, there's a lot of ways we can talk about this in a seemingly unrelated area of the body. It can have a profound effect throughout the entire organism. Because of the organizing centers of embryology, totally. Yeah, and so the organizing system of biology, of organisms are always trying to maintain order out of chaos. So we could talk a little bit about coherence. You can visualize chaos is like 100 children in a nursery with no supervision. <laughs> and we can reduce that to a mathematical perspective of one plus one equals two. And Con contrasted to that, we have crystal or, or order, which is like all of the hundred soldiers moving in an honor guard and they're marching in unison. So we can visualize that as one plus one equals one, because even though they're all different, they're doing the exact same thing visually. But the body is much more complex. The body is in a coherent state. That means it's trying to do both chaos and both organization or the crystalline structure at the exact same time. And it does it so magnificently well via these organizing centers. So the way we visualize that is like a hundred ballet dancers. Now, I don't know how many dancers are actually in a ballet, so, but let's say there's a hundred, right? But they're all dancing in unison, right? Yes. And they're dancing as one, but none of them are doing the exact same thing. Or, or some of them are at some points, you know? Mm -hmm. But yes. it's all a brilliant dance. And, and that's what Mei Wen Ho always describes as the quantum jazz. Mm -hmm. And that's how the universe behaves. That's how our body behaves. And there is no order. You know, therefore, to maintain optimal wellness, pharmacology will never understand that concept because they they only believe in in creating order out of chaos they don't understand the coherent state and if you really trust things you know for longevity for wellness you know something like uh, using drugs or or other modalities that are uh, more modern what do they actually do they're disrupting physiological function drugs are designed to intervene with how the body works. And if you're in an emergency, that can really save your life, right? Because mm -hmm. you're too much toward the chaotic state, right? But to maintain coherence, we need to begin to use more of the natural perspective and other modalities like chiropractic, like massage, like acupuncture that are so effective at assisting physiological function. And we need to bring that back, right? Because diseases are a discoherence of these electromagnetic waves. And Western medicine is refusing to believe that because they're addicted to a single factor way of thinking and always trying to find one specific explanation. So I think that's most of what I wanted to say. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a hundred. I think it's a hundred percent accurate. And so then let's let's kind of then dive in for these last like five or ten minutes about what. So people, okay, so people might be sitting at home being like, 
holy crap, that was like a ton of information about all this. And it's like really good stuff, but it's like, then how do I practically apply this? So we already said that you can go to practitioners who treat the whole system, who really look at their modality as uh, he, uh, enabling the body to heal itself looking at the entire, the, the entire human body, not just as like a system by system basis. So that might be number one, but then what about at home? Like, I, I think this goes back to nature again, right? So wh what would you say if I would be like, okay, Corey, I love that. I know that my energy needs to flow. I know that I have to have this beautiful balance between organization and chaos that ebbs and flows and that this information needs to get disseminated and this energy needs to flow everywhere. But where do I begin? Mm-hmm. You have to begin to understand that your body knows exactly how to heal itself when it's receiving the right information, right? Because that coherent state is not just something that is part of your, your own body's intercommunication, but it's part of your individual communication with your environment around you, right? So you need to have the appropriate information and energy delivered to your system to be able to maintain coherence, right? And by doing that, the simplest way is to spend more time outside. If I were to summarize everything that I want people to understand, the more time that you spend outside, the less disease you'll be and uh, you'll feel better and you'll live longer. And that sounds stupid, but when we understand the profundity of the electromagnetic influence on biological systems, it's really how it works. It's 100% how it works. And I think what people have to recognize is that we, we are so disconnected from the, uh, the, the frequencies that help us create organization and order and flow. We're so disconnected from those living our indoor lifestyles. Now, I do want to highlight, I have a, a wide open window in front of me. Thank you very much. But I am, yeah. I am in my basement. I am hardwired in my basement so that, you know, no children come down and disturb me. But, but that being said, um, we're very disconnected from, from these beautiful frequencies that help to, that we trap I believe that the water, the water traps the frequencies and it causes this resonance to happen. Right. And so we're just so disconnected from those frequencies. And instead we're in frequencies that have not been around, but for maybe a hundred years, when you talk about the frequencies of artificial light, when you talk about now we're talking about radio waves and microwaves and other non-native forms of electromagnetic frequencies these are things that we, the body will trap electromagnetic fields no matter what. And I think everyone has to recognize that your body will trap electromagnetic fields. You better hope that those electromagnetic fields are the ones that are driving function and are driving flow and are creating the appropriate balance of organization and chaos. And unfortunately these days, I think that the majority of the electromagnetic fields that that water in our, that liquid crystal in our bodies is, are trapping are these non-native and destructive electromagnetic fields. Mm -hmm. And that's the most fundamental aspect of biology, right? So, you know, most of the people that are health conscious really understand, they, they believe that it has more so to do with the nutritional aspect and food. And they think that they need to eat clean to maintain optimal health. And if they get that part down, then nothing else is gonna be a problem, mm -hmm. right? But in reality, our evolution has exposed us to a ton of unclean foods and all kind of crap in our environment, uh, you know, pathogens that we've consumed. And there's just pure garbage that our ancestors had to eat. I mean, not literally, but right. so many different detoxification pathways that our body has created to be able to get foreign uh, concepts, foreign molecules out back out of the body. And it works so extraordinarily well but we have no evolutionary adaptation to be exposed to uh, alien forms of light. They've never existed here. And it's something that we brought in and that's the major influence of the modern disease paradigm. And, and I, I, we have to shift away from this idea of mitochondria 
because I think mitochondria are important, but mitochondria making ATP and energy and that that's the main important thing. I, I'm going to do a whole thing on, on a, an entirely different perspective of looking at that, but we have to shift away from that. We need to make the appropriate energy in our mitochondria from the right foods. And instead we have to shift to, we need to pull in the right information into our liquid crystals. And that is what is most important. The information in our food, the information in our field is what is supremely the most important thing that we could have. And that yes, mitochondria will also be their, their electromagnetic receivers too. They're their own antenna and they put out bio photons, right? So there's that connection where the mitochondria are supremely important. They make water too, right? Um, yeah. And so that's where those mitochondria are supremely important, but you're hundred percent right. The number of clients I've had who say, well, I'm eating perfectly clean and it's not working for me. I, 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 all I have to do is ask them if they work in an office environment and nine and they'll say yes. And it's like, well, ding, ding, ding. Unfortunately, that's your problem there. I don't care if you're eating hundred percent organic paleo keto, whatever, you know, you think is best for your body. When you're in that toxic environment and you're so disconnected from the daylight night cycles, and you're so disconnected from nature, that is what is driving the disease and the chaos in your body, not the food that you're eating. Yeah, you nailed it, Carrie. Thanks, Corey. I really appreciate that. Uh, so, okay. So then let's, let's for the for one, let's do one minute to, I want to give like some fundamental, we say get out in nature. Right. But I think that I, there are a lot of people who are like, well, you know, I, I work a nine to five. I'm in the, I'm working in the bank nine to five. I'm a teller behind glass. I can't open that window. I, what the heck am I supposed to do? And so I want to leave people with a couple of like, yes, on the weekends, whenever you can after work, get outside, drive with the windows down. But what would you say to an office worker they need to do to start to incorporate what we're talking about? Prioritize every bit of free time that you have to getting as much exposure to nature as you possibly can. You know, I think going to the beach is the most underrated thing in the entire world. You know, when I was a kid, uh, you'd go to the beach and it'd be totally loaded. You wouldn't even be able to find a place to park. And now I can go any given weekend. I actually, I even went on Labor Day and there's hardly anybody there, wow. right? And then people wonder why they, they don't feel good or, you know, why they have psychological symptom, symptoms or physical symptoms or they end up with disease. It's a chaotic environment, right? with mm -hmm. uh, inappropriate information to the biological system. People, people need to just realize and study more about how biology works in nature and not how it works in a metabolic ward where modern research is done, because that doesn't explain how holism and wellness are achieved. Yeah, no, you hit the nail on the head. And I think, uh, I, I think just prioritizing that, that nature exposure as much as possible taking, you know, people get smoke breaks, you get your 15 minute light break, you know, go outside every little bit counts because when we're dealing at the quantum scale, that's tiny, tiny, tiny scale, small exposures can have huge ramifications, right? Me. And it's hard to understand because me doing one push up. Meh, you know, what one push up every day, meh, or maybe like one push up, you know, this hour and then two hours later, one push up and then two hours later, one push up mm, might not get me the effect that I want. That's a different scale. When you're looking at the scale of the energy and information and light that Corey and I have been talking about, you totally have to recognize that literally opening your window right now and getting all of the light frequencies into your environment even if it's just for 30 seconds, can have a huge nonlinear effect throughout your entire system. It does. And we're incapable of breaking the laws of mother nature. I think that's why the yin yang symbol has been adored for so many generations. But you have to realize why is it adored? It's because it means that we are inseparable from nature. And there are laws that mother nature has and when it is dark outside at night and you're exposing yourself to man-made light 
and you're getting man-made information that's destroying the fidelity of the system, you're breaking the laws of nature and you're going to have to face the results of that, right? There's no solution to that problem, unfortunately. Yeah, you're right. Nature always wins when it comes down to it, right? And I think you can, you can really truly project how well someone will do with their health and longevity based on their connection to nature. Exactly said. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with that to the core. Um, Corey, uh, anything else that you want to just throw in there the last 30 seconds? I'm totally good. Okay. I am too. I am too. Hey, thanks for coming. Can we uh, really like geek out on some of this stuff too at some point, maybe do a live together? That'd be awesome. 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 Thank you, Corey. Um, until next time, everyone, I hope you found something that will, that you can implement a tiny, tiny little 2% change. That's going to make yourself profoundly better as you add them up over time. So until next time, bye. Later.